Thank you for learning Siebel with the Siebel Hub. We have a unique, comprehensive and always up-to-date collection of Siebel CRM 2021 training classes. We can deliver live online and on-site training in the highest quality with the most experienced instructors. And we also offer a unique modular Siebel CRM 20 and 21 training. Follow the links in the description or on this slide to learn more and learn Siebel with the Siebel Hub. In this demonstration, uh, we will learn how to create a custom web service in uh, Siebel 20.12 and use the migration application, uh, application data service with transformation to migrate it to a test environment. So we are creating the development workspace already here in Siebel tools. The parent is an integration uh, workspace for a specific release. And inside this workspace, we are going to uh, create a custom business service, which we will expose as a web service. So to do that, and very quickly, uh, we will just copy the Siebel account service. So the Siebel account service is one of many EAI data synchronization services, also known as application services interfaces. And we just copy it and rename the copy to something meaningful. And we have a business service and we can uh, right click it and deploy as a web service. So Siebel tools will then do the heavy lifting for us so we can expose all the operations which we essentially just copied from the original and make sure the uh, URL endpoint is uh, correct. So this is our machine name here. Of course, your machine name will be very different. And it's HTTPS since it's Siebel 20. So this is our AI port. We use the standard EI ENU application. So rest of parameters is fine. It uses WS SOAP. And once we click Finish, that very business service is now exposed as an inbound uh, web service. And we can just verify that. So let's go to the application on, on the development database and check the inbound web services. We should find a new entry here, just created by Siebel Tools, by the wizard. Search for our business service name. We shall find it as active. And we see that all the operations are mapped to business service methods. And we have the address we specified in the wizard. So this is database tables that we look at. It's not workspace related. This now resides in the development database as information, uh, but the business service itself, as we can see when we click generate WSDL, uh, is not available to the application because it's in a development workspace that has not yet been delivered. So, but we can change that. We can literally inspect that workspace, thus making the information available to the current session and the just-in-time compiler will just kick in and help us when we click generate WSDL. Now it can find the business service and generate the WSDL file. And let's just test that out in SOAP UI. I want to make sure that web service is really operational. And that brings us to another interesting point in testing freshly created uh, business services or web services. So we are creating a, a SOAP project here. Uh, let's say all the boxes checked. And we just in, need to invoke one simple method like the account query by ID, which just takes a row ID 
of an existing account. So let's quickly create or find a row ID in the application. So here we got a test account, that's good enough. And that's the row ID. So that's our input parameter here. And since it's web service uh, security, WS SOAP, uh, we have to specify the header. And as documented, we pass the username token, password text, and session type as none. A session type none would just result in a single session per call, but that's fine for now. And we just hit the send button in SOAP UI and no cigar. That means, well, that can mean many things. It basically has trouble finding either the web service, it could be a caching issue for the EI object manager, or it could simply not locate the business service because the AI object manager runs on main workspace. So we, but we can tell it to literally open uh, the workspace we want, like we do now typing in the URL, appending our query parameters. And still no luck here. So uh, let's just restart EI object manager. And next time we do that, we have delivered the uh, workspace to the int release, to the integration workspace, and just demonstrate uh, with version one as the parameter, uh, we get a different error. So it can't find this business service now. And with version four, we get a correct result. So this just proves the point and the um, usefulness of these two parameters in SOAP queries, so we can specify that. And of course, that is against the development environment. So now we have maybe just proven that our new inbound web service works in the development environment. So we've done a unit test of sorts. Now we deliver that to the test branch. So we're ready for integration testing, deliver that release workspace to its parent, the test branch integration workspace. Okay, so that's a bit of high speed technology here. Here we go into the uh, migration rule expressions view. You can use the hyperlink from uh, the migration application or use the view directly in the application. And now we are going to create rules to actually export that inbound web service data that we have in the development database to export that and import that into our test environment. So this is one technique that allows us to um, yeah, use any arbitrary data in Siebel tables and export and import that. But we need to know the table names first. So with a bit of help here, uh, we find out the business object and business component names, uh, namely the business object. And we can use that information in Siebel tools to visualize the business object using a uh, few details. And we see that we can literally click on the boxes and see the information for uh, links and such and properties. And so we find out for each link, many-to-many -many link and uh, business component, we can find out the table names literally here. So a total of five tables is involved in uh, storing web service information. And you're totally right if you think that's a bit of overkill, but we just want to prove a point here <laughs> with the application data service. So uh, bear with me. Uh, you could perfectly find or uh, probably use uh, ADM uh, to create a hierarchical integration object, etc. But we want to use the application data service with a real life scenario. So what we're doing here is adding 
uh, each of the five tables that we identified to the migration rule expressions list by just selecting the table. And then we need to add a WHERE clause. And in our case, we can use the name column. So mind you, this is not Siebel query language. This is the name column. And the name is like BCRM percent, which is the, the first four letters of the name we chose. So we pick the next table from uh, Siebel tools in that case, and we add in the condition field, we add another WHERE clause uh, just to filter literally the records that will be exported. So with most tables, we have that name column and we can specify it by name. It might be a bit trickier if you can't do that. And one, one example for trickiness is to use, for example, last update greater than sysdate minus one. Note that sysdate is really an Oracle function. So we're really typing SQL portions here, SQL snippets rather than Siebel query language. So it's not that. So now we have all five tables. And for one table, we specify an update action, which will change the data once it's exported and put a different value in the export file. And in this case, we want to change the address because the test environment definitely has a different address and that's a port address column. And in our system, we have the same server name, but different port number. So you could have different server name, etc. So upon import, it will use that modified file and it will write this to the target database. So that's very nice, but it only works with simple statements. So again, that might be a bit far-fetched, but again, this is to demonstrate the application data service in with a real life example. So now we uh, got to select those tables that we want to use in the next migration. Uh, and select them all maybe and click export and nothing will be exported here. Please <laughs> uh, don't misunderstand that button. It will just produce two files in your migration folder in the Siebel file system on development. So if you go to the development file system migration folder, you will find two folders there, INP and RUL. In the INP folder, there will be a datamic.inp file and if you open that, it will have the information you entered in the table and condition fields. So literally the table and the WHERE clause. So these tables will be exported with that WHERE clauses. And the rule folder, RUL, will have a rule file. And that will have the information that you typed in in the update clause. And that's the correct syntax. to so don't change anything here. But you see the values we entered. So these two files are created when you hit that export button. To actually export the data, you need to run a migration plan. So now in the migration application, we are creating that plan and we're using synchronous migration for uh, inbound web service. So let's just call the plan inbound web service, description synchronous, and we drag and drop the environments and we choose the application data service uh, with transformations so that it will apply the rule file and the imp file and now when we execute that migration plan data will be exported and because it's synchronous will be imported into the target and that should actually be very fast because it's not much data so we see that, uh, yeah, five tables have been exported, 17 rows in total. So that sounds like the right number of rows here. Um, so the uh, data is already arrived on the target. And import is just running. Well, that's the uh, actually file transport. That's not the import of the data. The import is the last step here. So that's running now and we just see the five tables 17 records have been imported into production or into the target data.
database, which in our case is a test environment. Okay, so migration plans finished now. So now let's go into the uh, target environment and let's check if the data has arrived. So we go to inbound web services in the test environment. And if we look for the BCRM web service, it is active. The address points to the correct AI. Remember that update class we used? And uh, now, of course, we need to make sure that the business service arrives too. So we could have done it in uh, one migration plan, but uh, we have to launch another migration plan to do the incremental runtime repository synchronization. So that is, we can reuse an existing migration plan here and run it. And will tell us there's a new version of the integration test branch, which is the original workspace for our test environment, which we have migrated using full migration earlier. And we just let that run. It will take care of the uh, business service. So again, that's a high speed version. And now the business service is in place. Uh, let's maybe uh, find a, uh, well, a row ID of a test account. Again, we are in the test environment now. Get the row ID of a test account. And we, we haven't restarted the service yet, so that's a very bold move. But let's just fire up SOAP UI against the other address. Uh, that's the test server address and use the, the row ID. And it will ignore the workspace and version, um, by the way, on migration uh, test environment. So we see the test account of the test environment was really uh, returned. So we have successfully migrated a new custom inbound web service 